we are SP3D from uh, Melbourne, Australia, also an office uh, in uh, the north in Darwin. We also have an office in Detroit in the United States and here in Lübeck, North Germany for the EMEA region. Uh, personally, uh, I'm a little bit older, as you can see. Yeah, so I'm in this industry for 25 years. I, uh, for the US uh, persons in this, uh, I also serve as uh, the director of the International Committee of AMAC, which, uh, as a matter of fact, will happen uh, despite Corona, first week of May in Florida this year. And I can only encourage everybody to join there. Being a German in Germany, I cannot join because still travel restrictions apply internationally to come to the US. And I did not marry any person in the US or so, so I don't get a card to come. Uh, however, it will be more than 1,000 people from all I know uh, together and exchange information on 3D printing uh, just for you to understand. What is Speed 3D? Uh, we are a company that have picked up the cold spray process. What is cold spray? Cold spray is uh, a supersonic, three times the speed of sound, spraying of fine metal powder. Let's jump to, hello, let's jump here, uh, uh, which then stays solid, so it's not a melting process, and it does solidify on the surface it hits, and it will uh, then uh, grip into the unevenness uh, of the metal and build up uh, layers of metal very fast. Uh, we are up to 200 grams uh, per one minute uh, in copper and maybe 20 to 50 grams per one minute uh, in aluminum. Copper and its alloys as well as aluminum and its alloys are the materials we use at the moment. And that is indeed 100 or more times faster than the traditional laser powder bed, binder jetting or other technologies. Uh, so how does it work? We have a little video here. I hope it will play. Let's try this. Uh, there's no sound there. And you see this is an aluminum propeller that is built. You see the solid uh, so-called rocket nozzle there uh, that sprays the metal powder. You don't see the metal powder actually because it's so fast. And we're moving uh, a multi-axis robot arm over the nozzle and the powder solidifies on top of it. There is a tailor-made software we do deliver with the machine uh, that would calculate the movements of the robot. So you always have uh, the correct amount of powder and build up speed through that. Uh, what is important to mention, and we'll come to that a little bit later, is uh, number one, uh, the equipment we do offer with this process go up to one meter by 700 millimeters height with a weight up to 42, I think, kilograms. So it's one of the largest metal 3D printers that is available at this moment as a serious product. We've already sold, I think, 12 to the world in the last three years, uh, not only to Australia, but also to uh, Europe and Asia. Uh, so uh, they, they look red like this. Uh, and we jump to parts. You see here, this is aluminum parts, like a 50 centimeter height. Uh, uh, this is used in our own machine. So the machine builds part of itself. Uh, so this is also an environmental uh, a project, uh, which is quite nice. And what you can see here, it's a little bit uh, simplified. This is a defense application where we uh, don't worry, I'm getting to aerospace, uh, where uh, you have broken parts, you do a scan, you remodel it, you build the new part, you have a mechanical rework and the heat treatment, and within a few hours, and that is true, within a few hours, you can have uh, a refurbished part. So now, uh, already thinking a little bit square and different, incorporating the corona crisis into aerospace, uh, you might have heard about the effect that a pure copper surfaces kill coronaviruses as well as other viruses in less than two hours. Whereas on stainless steel, paper card box and plastic surfaces, those viruses may survive up to three days. Uh, this is scientifically proven and that would offer instantly a coating possibility 
to various touch and feel things on an airplane and around. Uh, that is another capability of this technology. It generally can coat one metal, for example, stainless steel or aluminum or whatever, with another metal, for example, copper. So we do have a capability of coating metals with other metals, which is not a welding, because you cannot weld copper on uh, aluminum, you could solder it, yeah? Uh, but uh, that comes into the scope, and if we jump like a little bit down, you see top line, uh, the third from left, this is a heat sink uh, extrusion profile of aluminum, and under it is a 10 millimeter thick a layer of copper because the heat dissipation of copper is much larger than the one uh, of uh, than the one of uh, uh, aluminum. That's what I was going to look for, and therefore uh, we have the ability to enhance processes by the mix of various metals. Is second thing which is symbolized by the top right is, you may say, but what about alloys I have not used before? And with this process, you would just mechanically mix different metals, metal powders, of course, uh, to form new alloys you have not used before. And those even mixes would be sticking together and give you a new material to use with the various strength parameters you can achieve with that. L lower picture line, the very left, is a like 40 centimeter high uh, copper uh, rocket nozzle for a rocket engine. Uh, you also, in, in our today's seminar, if you click on the Speed 3D button, you can see a 15 minute long video that will actually uh, show how this rocket nozzle is built. Um, and we can jump a little bit let me just one second jump through the process here no 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 oops sorry this is the one and you see this is a nearly 18 kilogram uh 36 pounds uh, of material and uh, the printing time of this raw part has only been 199 minutes and now uh, what, what I did not hear today in our presentation about uh, in our presentations and discussions about aerospace is doing the be bespoke high end, high complexity parts is obviously one task of 3D printing uh, within our field uh, of aerospace. But there also is the other side of things where you say we have a trend to cheap one-way use or a few times use, particularly rockets uh, for small satellites. You, you all um, might have heard about the uh, satellite project of Elon Musk, who uh, wants to put like uh, Starlink, is it called the project, 5,000, 4,600, 5,000 satellites all around the world to have uh, internet connection in every region of the world, not only in the industrialized countries, uh, or you have uh, the multitude of 10 by 10 by 10 centimeter cube satellites, which are sent up there to have a redundancy in case one satellite wouldn't work, uh, one of the others would work. So the overall mission, which is very expensive so far, uh, it does work. So there is various companies throughout Europe and the US who do get millions and millions of funding these days to work on cheap one-way use rockets. And here is a technology which particularly does not do the high-end uh, parts, which take weeks and are very expensive and stuff, but do the fast low-end parts, which however offer the capability of using uh, the, the metals of choice because the physics and the heat dissipation gradients are very nice for this. Uh, also, the, uh, there's ISAR uh, uh, a rocket, the one in Bavaria. There, there is a semi-professional, semi, semi-private uh, semi initiative uh, companies also uh, 
uh, Harlem Pulse, there's people who do paraffin rockets. Uh, you have uh, the former part-time scientists who were part of the Google Luna X Prize and now got renewed after the company went down. You have uh, Copenhagen suborbitals and a lot of other companies in Europe that uh, do that, not to the extreme like Blue Origin in the US, for example. So a big new market coming up, also good for um, uh, high frequency antennas or actually uh, doing them in a very cheap way with the uh, hollow metals uh, uh, made of copper. We spoke already about the door handles and other stuff. And, and I would like to take this Gunners Ratchet, uh, although it's not a particular aerospace part, but I think it shows very well and serves an example on obsolete parts management and uh, uh, also works directly into all the simple, cheap, but maybe essential tools you need in the aerospace industry. Uh, we have done a few projects for people as well. They just didn't want us to show it here live. So that's why I used this one. What is this? This is a super simple, stupid spanner that is used by the Australian Armed Forces in their light armored vehicles to, uh, to rework uh, blockings within the gun. Yeah, so this is like a 30 centimeters, 12, 15 inches long thing. Uh, what happens in everyday use in the desert, in the field, people drive that vehicle, the spanner lies around somewhere, bumpy roads, spanner gets lost, spanner is gone. Number one, you cannot put the gun into operation again. Uh, or the cannon or others. Number two, you order this part in peace times, and I repeat, it's a stupid metal spanner, yeah? This will cost you 9,000 Australian dollars and take 12 months to get it, yeah? Because of all the processes involved. We took a machine to the red soil desert in Australia, and in the desert, did reprint this part in 60 minutes. And the average cost was 100 US dollars for that. So this is where part of the more simpler uh, obsolete parts uh, uh, management wants to go. So like, as I say, and uh, well, maybe this is not uh, appropriate anymore. Everyone looks at the supermodels uh, in the magazines, but uh, Everyone wants to marry someone to steal horses with, right? Which is a different category. So we're more into this business uh, to make people happy with everyday uh, operation and use for that. And we believe, actually, let me jump uh, to sort of the end and we see the operations here that we really did it in the army as well as in the Navy. Uh, and well, the Air Force, I should speak about that. Uh, so. Uh, this is an area which has not been tackled by the metal 3D printing method so far. And uh, I think there is a huge application and use, uh, particularly, finally speaking about COVID again, uh, where uh, people in mobile units, people being remotely and, and not back uh, in harbor or in the barracks or wherever, or in the airport as well, uh, can have a global just uh, in time uh, supply on demand, but due to the closed borders and unfortunately a lot of casualties and sick people, uh, we all have to think about remote logistics and isolated uh, yeah, supply areas, let me call it that way. Uh, again in future. And we feel pretty safe to be part of that and be able to serve this market. And that's why I also joined that company and find it quite uh, thrilling and impressive, although it looks a little bit more simple than some other technologies. So uh, yeah, this was the, the little glimpse of what's possible. Uh, you can also visit us today in this chat. We're also on floor one, table eight. Uh, also, please best uh, go to our YouTube channel, uh, Speed3D, um, 
uh, there is plenty of videos of all the different applications and also a 30 minute walk around the factory and have a look at uh, uh, the use of the machines. We are working, I should say that, we are working on a project to put this whole as a little factory into containers, uh, which would enable us to move the containers to any place in this world and have a remote factory of bespoke metal parts, foundry-like, just without a foundry. Uh, and so uh, cure the situation and make everybody happy. I'd say Red Adair in Iraq those days would have been happy to have something like that.